we go back to Marx and Engels, um, if you want to find the conclusions they drew in the early days, read the German ideology. Um, this is a book, I mean, I would say a, it's, it's in two sections, particularly the first section, which is a more a general exposition of the ideas of Marxism, the philosophical outlook, dialectical materialism, etc. It's all quite well explained there. Um, and yet, think about it, Marx and Engels wrote this and then didn't publish it. Um, it actually, the whole work was only published in 1932. The whole uh, book uh, as, as a whole, sections of it were published earlier, but the, the, the actual uh, full, full version only came out then, long after they were dead. Um, and in fact, Marx and Engels pointed out that in writing that text, what they did was they clarified the ideas and the methods, <coughs> first and foremost, to themselves. Basically, it was a clarifying of their understanding of how society works and the basic laws of society. And once they'd established that understanding, they proceeded to, 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 to try and build an organization based on those ideas. And you'll find their ideas in all their works, you know, in anti during you'll find it in Capital, you'll find it in, 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 a, lot of the, in a lot of their works. Um, but that was, that was really, if you want to say, that was the, 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 the period in which the, Mar uh, the, Mar the Marxist movement was founded. When Marx and Engels actually uh, brought together all the threads and understood um, society as a whole. Now, <clears throat> that was in uh, 1845. Engels also wrote The Condition of Work Class in 1844. There's very often that they try and portray Engels as being the sidekick of Marx. When actually Engels was an outstanding theoretician in his, um, uh, by, by himself, although he always recognized the greater genius of, uh, of Marx. But they worked together very closely in, in developing the ideas. And um, <clears throat> once they had the ideas, they turned towards organized workers and tried to win them to their ideas. Now, before the First International, you have what's called the Communist League, which was uh, um, a product of an organization that was called the League of the Just. Um, now, in the League of the Just um, was a German workers' organization abroad. Um, and it had been founded in 1834. So it existed long before Marx and Engels um, came on the scene. Um, and it was a, a utopian socialist, even Christian uh, influenced uh, group. Um, and their um, slogan, their motto was, all men are brothers, which is uh, not a class way of looking at things. Because there are some men in society, or women, that I wouldn't consider brothers, but they're the class enemy. Um, now, they, their goal was this, the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth, based on the ideals of love of one's neighbor, equality, and justice. As you can see, it's not a scientific socialist, it's not a Marxist approach. It's a very primitive, idealistic, utopian approach to the, to the question. Um, in 1847, this, sort of, this organization had about 1,000 members worldwide. Um, and um, the Communist League comes into existence uh, by a merging of the League of the Just with the 15-man Communist Correspondence Committee of Brussels, which was headed by Karl Marx. They fused. And basically, what Marx and Engels did was to provide the political leadership to the League of the Just and to give them a scientific understanding of society. And in fact, on the basis of Marx's influence within the, 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 the new Communist League, the slogan was changed from all men are brothers to working men of all countries unite, which is, which is the slogan at the end of the uh, Communist uh, Manifesto. And they renamed the organization the Communist League. Um, and it was at the second Congress of the Communist League in um, November and December 1847 that Marx and Engels both attended and they were mandated there to write um, a manifesto for, the, for this new organization and that's the origins of the Communist Manifesto. The Communist Manifesto was written by Marx and Engels upon the request of the Communist League and it became really the founding document of the 
communist movement, in, in the communist in the sense of scientific socialist uh, uh, Marxism, not utopian um, socialism. Um, eventually, um, after the, the, the defeat of the 1848 revolutions, because think about it, they, they were forming this organization on the eve of revolution across Europe. 1848 was a year of revolutions affected Italy, uh, France, even Malta. I once went to Malta, Malta, history, history book of Malta, and found that even Malta was affected by 1848. Um, no part of Europe um, uh, was unaffected in one way or another. Um, now, that went down to defeat, and the defeat of, the, of, the, um, of, the, uh, of that revolution also had an impact on the Communist League, um, which uh, so many of their leaders were arrested. Um, it had an impact on the organization as a whole. And in 1852, um, it was wound up as an organization. But it was the precursor of what was to become um, the first international, the International Working Men's Association. Um, and um, now, there were divisions between uh, members of the League. Um, um, there were the, the, the followers of Marx who looked to a scientific socialist approach and then there was uh, the insurrectionary utopians, the, those who believed in um, you know the, 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 you could plot, you could take power through some kind of secret um, organization etc. And it actually led to a split. Um, now between 1847 and 1864, there were several attempts to uh, set up different forms of international associations. Um, but um, we have to look at the political situation. 1848 was a defeat uh, for, for the movement. And after 1848, there was a period of capitalist expansion. Um, with this came an important element, which was a strengthening of the working class. With the expansion of capitalism, the growth of industry, you also have, as a consequence, the growth of the working class itself. And through that, you also have the struggles of the working class, which throw up organizations of the working class to defend themselves against um, the capitalists. So it's a pity. After 1848, you have this development. And then in 1857, you have an economic crisis. Capitalism was going through periods of expansion and periods of recession, something which Marx was, was, was to analyze in capital, in the cyclical development of capitalism. Um, now, Marx, you know, in, in the Marxist movement, there's very often discussions about, oh, you made a mistake. You said this would happen, but it didn't. Therefore, everything you say is useless, is the, is the, is the logical consequence. Well, if you want to look at Marx's perspectives for 1857, they thought this, you know, 1848 defeated, but this, this, was, this was the one, this was the, 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 the big one. Um, and it didn't lead to that. Um, in 1859, there was the Franco-Austrian War, Italian independence, these movements were taking place. Um, and there was a, new, a renewed boom after, after the crisis. Now, the period of boom uh, in Britain had put an end to the heyday of Chartism. Um, Chartism was the really the first mass movement, uh, political, politicized mass movement of the British working class, with huge rallies and demonstrations up and down the country. Um, but that was cut across by a long period of expansion of, of uh, British capitalism. Um, and you see how conditions determine political developments. The period of uh, expansion allowed a certain softening of the class relations in Britain. Um, Engels actually spoke of the long sleep of the British working class after the demise of the, of the Chartists. It took something like 40 years before um, there was a serious movement. Um, and that was the basis of the growth of the influence of um, what, you, what they called moderate liber liberalism amongst the, the British workers. Um, because in, instead of the need to overthrow the system because of crisis, it seemed that it would be possible to just work within the system with the most liberal elements and win concessions for the workers within capitalism. 
Now you can see what I'm saying here is describing the situation in the 1800s. But you think of the period after the Second World War, and it's on an even bigger scale, that illusion. And it's the material conditions which determine the illusions in certain ideas. Now the idea was wrong, but it gripped the minds of many. Why? Because for a certain period of time, it seemed to work. Capitalism was expanding. So anybody <coughs> coming along like Marx or Engels and saying, well, look, it actually is full of these contradictions which leads to crisis, which was correct, but it, did, it, it didn't uh, change the thinking of a significant layer of the workers because they were looking at their immediate conditions and the immediate developments. Um, now, the, the boom of 1857 created that, and then we had the crisis of 1857, and with that came a growing questioning of the system um, and a growing level of class struggle. And with it, a, grow, a further growth of the labor organizations as the workers attempted to organize themselves, to defend themselves against the consequences of crisis. Um, and it was in the period 1858 to 67, for example, that you had the rise of the trades councils in Britain. Um, the or local organizations of workers on, on a say, city-wide basis, the delegates from the different industries, um, and a growing level of strikes. Now, what happened with the, with, the, with the wave of strikes developing? The bosses used foreign workers to replace the striking workers. And we've seen that. That's nothing new. Where they used um, you know, desperate unemployed workers from another country, speaking a different language, offering them uh, work and money, to replace the striking workers. Now this posed concretely the need to combat the bosses in this, in, in this the need for international solidar solidarity um, and for some organization that could organize that. And that, as you will see later on, is an important element of the work of the First International. Um, it actually um, met the immediate needs of workers of different political think uh, thoughts. You know, you had liberal-minded workers and trade unionists, socialists, and non-socialists. But this was an immediate uh, problem that had to be tackled. Um, and therefore, the, 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 growth, the growth of an international association of workers f um, um, fitted um, the situation. In France, we had a different situation, because after 1848 um, and the December 1851 coup, and the establishment of the Second Empire, the, the regime became more repressive, and there was a temporary weakening of the French working class as a result of this defeat. And again, this also had its effect in the thinking of, uh, of workers and activists. Um, in those conditions, there was a turn towards the ideas of cooperatives and mutual aid organizations, away from the idea of revolution as the answer to the problems, because revolution seemed to be off the agenda because of the defeats that they'd suffered and because of the regime. And therefore, there was a turn to, the, to, to, um, um, to this kind of thinking. And it's in these conditions that you have the development of Proudhonism. Now, if you want to uh, deepen your understanding of that, read Marx's Poverty of Philosophy, um, when, uh, when he, he responds to Proudhon. You see, Proudhon expressed an idea, an idea which refused um, workers' political revolution as an answer to the problems. Um, it refused the political organization of the working class as separate from, from the bosses. Um, and this was a reflection of the downturn in the movement um, itself. Um, and you see, um, it, throughout history, you see that in such conditions, alien ideas penetrate into the movement. Um, and we've seen it many times. When the, when the material conditions change radically, um, for instance, the post-war period after the Second World War, an enormous strengthening of the ideas of reformism takes place in the decades following the Second World War. Now, were the reformists right? Of course they were not right, because we're now living in the middle of one of the biggest and deepest crises of capital capitalism has ever seen. But the boom lasted for quite a long time. And if it lasts for a long time, the tendency of ordinary people is to say, well, you know, the last 20 years, the last 30 years, what Marx said did hasn't happened. Well. And that means it's not going to happen. Um, I don't know if you saw the um, interview with Alan Woods yesterday from BBC, where they were very, very democratic. They gave Alan a few sentences, and then they had a panel uh, 
without our Marxists sitting there to answer them, and a, a representative of the Adam Smith Institute <laughs> saying things like, um, you know, social polarization of the, the disparity in wages and the growth of wealth in one end of society is not a bad thing, it's a good thing because it creates jobs and therefore it's, it's good for workers. It's basically saying <coughs> that it's good for poor people, for the rich to get richer. You sit there and you sit there and you wonder, well, these guys are obviously getting a lot of money and have done a lot of studying, and this is the kind of stuff they can produce. But um, these are the kind of ideas that are, are not just within the bourgeois, they've penetrated deep within society and also into the labor movement organizations. Now, we know it's not true. Um, now, in the last 10 years or so, it is becoming more and more evident that those ideas are not true. But for a long period, um, they seem to be common sense. Look, uh, capitalism is booming, people are getting rich, but the workers are also, they're buying houses and cars and look at the standard of living. It seemed to be true, but it wasn't. And, and, and alien ideas penetrate into the labor movement and they affect the very leadership of the movement. Now, um, in France, there'd been a political defeat of the working class in 1848 to 51. But there was a further economic development of France with a growing industry and, a, and therefore a strengthening of the pro proletariat. And the working class began to get stronger and um, to organize. Um, initially, in most countries, the first political steps of the working class were within the confines of bourgeois politics, i.e. Um, looking for the sort of the liberal bourgeois elements, those who would grant some reforms in terms of conditions, etc., for, for the workers. Um, and gradually what happens is the workers to experience begin to separate from the bourgeois um, uh, on a political front and move towards their own um, form of organization. In Germany, after the early 50s, there was um, a reaction uh, after the defeat of 1848 but there, was, there began, on the base of the development of industry there as well, a new way of organization of the working class, still influenced at that stage by um, bourgeois liberalism. Now, um, in 1853, for example, there was the foundation of the General Union of German Workers under Ferdinand um, Lassalle. Um, who later will play a role, uh, though the Lasallians will play a role in the German social democracy, but that's more pertinent to the Second International. There was another movement that parallel to this, which was called the League of German Workers' Unions, which was linked to August Bebel and Wilhelm Liebknecht, who were two Marxist propagandists. They were connected to Marx and Engels and declared themselves to be in agreement with the idea of scientific socialism. This was later to lead to the founding of the, um, uh, uh, the Social Democratic Party. Um, now, we had similar developments of the working class movements in Belgium, in Austria, in Italy, in Spain, in Switzerland. We had the beginnings, wherever there was the growth of industry, there was also with it obviously the development of the working class and its organizations. Now, it was this international revival of the working class based on the boom this is what some people don't, you know, believe in, uh, not thinking dialectically. It's the boom conditions, i.e. growth of industry, and therefore growth of the working class, which leads to the growth of the working class organizations. In a period, not of crisis, but a period of growth of, of, of the system. Now, um, and this was moved, this were, these were the conditions in which there was a movement towards the building of some form of international organization. Um, in 1864, in September, um, there was a meeting called in London, and a resolution was passed to found an international organization of the workers. That is 1864. Um, they established the center in London, and they elected a committee of 21 members. At the foot, at the end of the list of the 21 members, is the signature of a certain Dr. Marx. I think he got a PhD. That's what he calls the doctor. Um, now, after much discussion, Marx, is, Marx had drawn up some draft rules for the new organization. 
and they were adopted as the basis of the new organization. Um, now, as I said before, not all those who made up this new international organization were communists. Um, it was the early days, and there were all kinds of trends involved. Um, there were liberal bourgeois, not just, not just in thinking, but actually uh, bourgeois liberals, who saw the, the organization as a means of promoting their own agenda. They saw it as a way of influencing the working class. In some sections, like the Swiss uh, section, um, there was even a, a bourgeois, uh, a capitalist who joined, a guy called Coulery, who, who we'll see later on. Um, the British trade unionists, many of them were members of the First International, but they never really accepted Marx's ideas, not except to work with these people, but they were not uh, socialists. Um, they saw the international as a means of promoting their own narrow trade union interests. For instance, during strikes, as I referred to before. They saw that that, that was a concrete thing they saw, you know, the, the need to have uh, an organization in other countries where the strike takes place to combat the, um, the use of, uh, of blacklegs. Several of these British trade unionists later on went on to become members of parliament, but not as socialists, they were liberals. Liberal M M MPs. Um, these, th th this, is, this gives you an idea of the kind of people Marx was working with. In France, you had the Proudhonists who led the, uh, the French sections. The international wasn't actually, it wasn't an international of national sections. Um, you didn't have the French section, the Italian section, the German, the Austrian. You had uh, the Paris section, the Geneva section, uh, you know, the this is how it was organized. It was one international organization with different uh, branches in different uh, cities. Um, now, the Proudhonists, in effect, were, were the, an early version of reformism, which emerged out of the conditions which I described earlier. Um, the point is this, though. Once the first international was formed, with all these elements, which were clearly not Marxist, the direction of its development um, was towards communism. And it, that was because of the nature of class society and capitalist society. And the bourgeois liberals within the international were quite disappointed by the way the, the, the direction it was taking. Because it was based on the working class, inevitably had to move in a certain direction. And with, of course, the, the, the active intervention of Marx and Engels in guiding the organization towards certain ideas. Um, the international wasn't just wasn't a section of you know a group of socialists in this place. Or that. There were actual whole organisations could affiliate, trade unions, um, di different associations, and and all the members of that organisation would be considered members of the first international. Now the first conference um, was held in London in 1865, um, but in in these days, apart from Britain. Now, Britain at the time was the most developed capitalist country and had the most developed labor organizations. Um, the labor movement in Europe was still at quite an embryonic stage. And with that came all kinds of confused ideas within um, the movement. Um, that conference decided to organize a congress with delegates from organizations who could vote. Now, the new organization had a base in Britain, in France, in Switzerland, in Germany, in Austria. And it was beginning to develop initial support in countries like Italy, Spain, and even in the United States, in Chicago, there was a Congress of Workers that expressed interest in the new organization. Um, now, the main task of the new international was educational, to combat alien ideas within the labor movement. And Marx, that was his task within um, the organization. Um, as I said, it was made up of local sections. There were no national workers' parties that could adhere because there were no such things. There were no mass independent workers' parties in, in, in Europe that could become part of, a, of an international. Um, now, just a little note on France. Um, I mentioned the Bonapartist repression that took place after 1848, which crushed the workers' organizations. Um, in these conditions, you had the phenomenon of Blanquism, after Blanqui, um, that believed in conspiratorial insurrectionary uh, methods. 
which reflected they were out of touch with the masses. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't see the struggle as a movement of the class, as a class, but as a movement of secret conspiracies of small groups. And also in France, you had Proudhonism, which I mentioned before, which were basically pacifist anarchists. You know, anarchists usually as today are considered those who go and provoke violence and demonstration. <coughs> they consider themselves pacifists. Um, the main thing is, they oppose the political struggle of the working class. Um, in reality, this phenomenon was an expression of, um, I suppose, what, what Lenin would have called the, aristoc the aristocracy of labor, uh, the labor aristocracy, the, the very top layers of the working class, which had gained certain privi privileges, let's say, compared to, to the mass. Um, and at the same time, it reflected a lack of industrial development, and therefore no clear working class movement um, across Europe. That explains the confusion. Um, there were a lot of petty proprietors and independent artisans. Um, if, for example, so much was, the, was this the case that at uh, the Geneva Congress in, in 1866, of the first international, there was a proposal that the International Working Men's Association should become a worldwide cooperative movement. So instead of an organization um, with a perspective of inevitable revolution, on the basis of the contradictions of capitalism, an organization of co-ops uh, to solve the problems of the workers within the capitalist system. Um, now, um, the, um, the, the sectarianism that, that, that uh, both the Blankists and the Proudhonists were represented, the Lasallians in Germany, etc., um, they, were, they, were, they were a consequence of the situation that existed within um, the working class and their relative isolation from the mass of workers and their lack of understanding of how um, uh, workers would move. And they also insisted on separating, if I can find the quote, um, separating um, the political struggle, uh, separating the economic struggle from the political struggle. They didn't see a link between the two. They were basically at a trade union level in terms of their understanding. Um, of what was um, uh, required. Um, and they opposed anybody that uh, tried to push in a political direction. That explains the conflicts with, um, with Marx. Um, but um, in those early days, an interesting point is um, the, Par the Paris group of the First International proposed the exclusion of women workers from the First International. Um, and they said that the woman's place is the home, not the forum. Nature has made her nurse and housewife, nature. Um, do not let us withdraw her from these social functions, etc., etc. This was the Parisian section. Um, now, the same French Proudhonists who proposed this, um, they were against admitting um, brain workers, as they call them, they call them, intellectuals to the international. They had a prejudice. They had actually a workerist prejudice. And you often see this. On the one hand, everybody's got it. got to be workers. Only workers. And then, politically, absolute utter reformists. Um, the reason they, they opposed the intellectuals, they thought that they would bring in political struggle. And that they would push the organization towards um, political um, uh, movement. Um, they couldn't understand that the economic struggles of the working class would inevitably bring the working class into a political conflict with the, with the capitalist class. And you couldn't separate the economic from the political. One f would flow from the other. And um, Marx was combating these ideas, um, all, of these, all of these prejudices, um, throughout the period of the, um, of the existence of the, of the um, first international. Um, in um, 1866, um, there was a congress in Geneva. Uh, sections in France, Germany, and Switzerland were represented, and the General Council itself. Now, again, some of the French members wanted to limit the membership to manual workers. Well, you couldn't even if you were clerk, you could join. Um, and they were, but at the same time as they wanted to limit it to manual workers, they were against strikes. As a, as, a, as a means of struggle of the workers, and they were in favor of co-ops. Now you can see this is reformism, 
present within the early days of the labor movement and the Marxist combating the reformist ideas. Now, um, the General Council raised the, the slogan of uh, the call for the eight-hour day and the abolition of night work. Now, here we see how um, they actually took on the immediate needs of the workers, reduced the working day, which is a slogan which has been in existence from the very early days of the labor movement up till today, um, and the abolition of night work, which was um, a burden on the workers. Interesting, interestingly, Coleray, who I referred to earlier, that bourgeois from Switzerland, he thought calling for an eight-hour day was excessive, was extreme. He suggested that the slogan should be for a ten-hour day. Probably that's because he employed workers. Um, the, um, on the question of the cops, the general counsel didn't come out against cops <coughs> as such, in the same way that we would not oppose workers you know, setting up a cooperative, but we would explain that it's not the solution to the problems of the working class as a whole. The idea that everybody forms a co-op um, as a solution is false because it's not the question of co-ops, it's the way the economy functions. Think about it, if the workers form co-ops and the whole economy was in the hands of the workers running as separate individual co-ops, they would be competing against each other. And the same rules would apply that apply to capitalism and you'd have a crisis, except the difference would be the workers would have the right to vote for who should be sacked rather than uh, being told by the boss. It wouldn't change anything um, fundamental. Now, um, what they said was, in the, in the, on the co-ops, um, the cooperative movement is incompetent by its own unaided powers to achieve a transformation of the capitalist order of society. That's what Marx explained to, um, uh, to, to, to the movement. Um, he says, that is why the workers must seize the administrative power, wresting it from the hands of capitalists and landlords. And then, but, they, but, but in not opposing, because inevitably the co-ops would come into existence, he says that all the workers employed by a cooperative should be paid the same standard working wage, regardless of whether they are or not members of the society. For this will tend to hinder the degeneration of the cooperatives into ordinary capitalist companies. This is very, very far-sighted thinking, because if you think of what has happened to the cooperative movement since its early days, if you work for a co-op in Britain, what difference is there from working for Sainsbury's or any other supermarket? And in countries where the cooperative movement has become, has become quite big, for instance in Italy after the Second World War, it was a big cooperative movement, they have become bourgeois companies. Um, in fact, the right wing of the Italian Communist Party was one of its bases was the cooperative movement, the managers, the businessmen, and some of them grew into huge companies with multinational interests. You cannot remove capitalism and combat capitalism by building within it the cooperative movement. The cooperative <coughs> movement will be absorbed into the capitalist system. And what they tried to do was put a limit and putting demands to defend even those workers employed by the corps. So you see the kind of discussions they were having. <coughs> now, in 1866, there was another recession, one of the cyclical recessions after the 1857. Um, and this led to strikes. And in the period 1866 to 68, there were many strikes. And the international was fully involved in all of these movements, um, supporting strikes, giving advice, providing leadership, providing finance, collecting funds, raising solidarity. This was the practical day-to-day uh, -day work of the international, upon which it was built and, and, and consolidated. Um, for example, there was the bronze workers' strike in Paris in February 1867. Um, I can quote here uh, from a work on the first international. Um, in its intervention in strikes, the international had two aims. First of all, to prevent the import of foreign strike breakers, as I referred to earlier as, for example, during the strike of the sieve makers, sieve makers, um, tailors and basket makers in London. And secondly, to give direct aid to all the strikers by inaugurating collections and sending money. All this made the new organization immensely popular in working class circles, where the idea was now gaining ground that the international was a faithful champion of the proletariat and was fighting valiantly on behalf of the workers' interests. In this respect, the bronze workers' strike in Paris, February 1867, was of great importance. When the employers decided to crush the recently formed organization of bronze workers, 
suddenly discharged several hundred of those who had joined the Union, the latter turned to help for help to London, and is the centre of the First International. The General Council, convinced that the whole question of the right of the workers to organise was at stake, conferred with the British trade unions, which hastened to give the Parisians unlimited credit. The sections of the international and other countries likewise came to the aid of the Paris comrades, and the employers were soon compelled to make concessions. Now this is something, you know when they talk about Marx, they describe him as being somebody who sat in a room reading books and writing about capitalism, uh, not really being involved in any of the struggles. But this, is, this is an indication of what he was doing in practice, as well as spending a lot of time studying capitalism and writing capital, which is equally as important. But there was a constant uh, participation in the struggles of the working class, and through it, strengthening the, fir the First International uh, as a whole. And there were similar developments in Belgium, strikes in Britain, and other uh, countries. Um, now, at the Second Congress uh, of the International in Lausanne in September 1867, we have the first resolution presented to a Congress of the International calling for collective, collective ownership. Now, that shows you that before they didn't have that. Um, and it made, this, this was to the um, collective ownership of the means of transport, right? the nationalization of the means of transport. What you see throughout the whole history of the First International is how Marx doesn't turn up at the First Congress, has a fully worked out communist program in every little detail, and demands that it be voted and that uh, that should be the program. They, they base themselves on the real movement of the working class, responding to the, to, the, to the different struggles and the needs of the workers, and gradually building up and introducing um, elements of the communist program. And here we have it in, the, um, in, the, in this resolution. Now, um, if, you, if you look at, um, they declared that all the means of transport and exchange should be taken over by the state. It was the first concrete formulation of the idea of collective ownership of the means of production and exchange. And it foreshadowed the fierce struggle which was subsequently to rage around the question of the international. This is, this is a determining element in, was, is, this a, is this a communist international or is it just a, a reformist, trade unionist, uh, bourgeois liberal association? Um, now, in uh, describing Marx here, it says Marx was not merely unwilling to impose on the mass of the workers any system which was not an obvious deduction from their experience in the daily struggle. Um, he also wished to avoid forcing the pace of the proletarian movement. Marx understood something which many people on the left do not understand. It's one thing what the Marxists or the communists understand as being necessary. It's another thing the workers being convinced of that necessity. And that conviction can only come through their concrete experience. And what Marx did was to um, base himself on each concrete experience and raise the level one step further, and working it, basically working it up towards a fully worked out communist position. Um, Marx, the same text continues, was convinced that the natural extension of the economic or industrial struggle would bring the workers face to face with the problem of the political struggle on a national scale. This signifying at first the struggle for the democrat democratization of the political system and then the struggle for power. They would also in due course be confronted with the struggle on the international scale, this signifying the struggle to bring about the international socialist revolution. Um, here we have um, the method of Marx. Um, and that method is also um, inherited and passed down to the Marxists up till today. You have to take up the day-to-day -day issues, connecting it to the inevitable movement towards um, socialist um, the revolution. Um, and Marx understood that you had to use the struggle for reforms under capitalism as a means of uh, helping the workers to draw the political conclusions, as opposed to the Proudhonists and the Bakunists. That they saw the struggle in itself for that particular economic reform and didn't see it as part of a wider political struggle for the overthrow of the system as a whole. Um, now, um, we have at the same time um, an attempt to build an alternative to the international, which was the, uh, what 
uh, the League of Peace and Freedom. Um, and in the early days, because of the influence of the Predonists, who, who leaned towards the ideas of the League of Peace and Freedom, they sent delegates to the conference of this organization. Marx was against. He, he argued against sending delegates. Um, but he failed to convince them. And so they sent the delegates. Um, it, it was taken up later. Eventually, Marx won the argument through experience. And eventually, they said nothing to do with, the, with these people. Um, now, as the working class developed in France, and as a consequence, we started to move politically, um, with a desire to bring down the imperial regime, which is, they saw as their main objective, the futility of Proudhonism became exposed in practice. Here we have a, a, a dictatorship, um, a, a regime which the workers see as something which has to remove, be removed, and the establishment of workers' rights, and the Proudhonists are arguing <coughs> the workers shouldn't be involved in political um, struggle. It didn't correspond to their needs. At Lausanne, there was a resolution on the struggle for political freedom, um, uh, which led to the arrest of all the members in France of the First International, because obviously it was, our, it was aimed against the regime in France. Um, and it led to the dissolution of the section in Paris, and the organization was then forced underground. But there were more strikes in this period. There were the Geneva building workers, which were actually, the strike was led by the Geneva branch of the First International. And they won the strike, which massively enhanced the authority of clearly the First International. In Belgium, there were strikes, and the International raised support for the striking workers. The International's influence throughout the labor movement in Europe was growing. In Brussels, in September 1868, the Third Congress gathers, and the question of war is discussed. And we see how um, the, 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 the position is developing. Um, the resolution uh, uh, on war at the Brussels Congress um, says nothing can put an end to war except social reorganization, i.e. a change of society. Um, and it talks about the right belongs especially to the working classes, and it says, it calls on to take the most vigorous action to prevent a war between the peoples which today could not be considered anything else than a civil war. Already here we have what would later become resolutions of the Second International. If the bourgeois of, the, of different countries push towards war, uh, worker against worker, the, the task of the International is to push towards civil war, i.e. class war between workers and, and, and bosses. Um, um, it says, the Congress urges the workers to, see, to cease work should war break out in their respective countries. This was, this was a further development of the um, uh, position of the international. And it, at that Congress, Marx won the argument on the question of League of uh, Peace and uh, Friendship. And the Congress of, of the international refused to send delegates uh, to that organization. Um, the reduction of hours was also raised as an indispensable, indispensable demand of the First International. Now, what we mean is by 1868, the communist idea, the communist understanding of society, had become victorious within the International. Um, in terms of clear statement on collective ownership in both um, the means of production and land, not just transport. Um, and what, what we have is... Um, the, um, the results of patient work within the First International on the part of Marx and others for communist ideas against the other trends. And you see how he did it in a, in a patient manner, a firm, arguing the case, at the same time intervening in the struggles of the working class, and gradually on the basis of experience and of discussion, um, winning the organization as a whole to the positions of scientific socialism. Now, in terms of membership, it's not clear. Uh, the fig they're not clear figures for this, because there were affiliated organizations with members, uh, trade unions, etc. But some of the figures we have indicate that in Belgium, the organization had 64,000 members. Um, in Britain, they had 230 branches and 95,000 members. In Austria, 13,000 members. But when we look at membership, we've got to be careful. It's not like individual members, you know, reading the manifesto of the Communist Party, then left wing communism, then the revolution of trade, transition program, do you agree with the uh, no, join on an individual basis and you're recruited as a Marxist. In many cases, you were a member of one or other 
workers' organization which affiliates it. Um, therefore, there's a, there's a slight difference there. But it shows you the influence they have, particularly in Britain, um, in terms of, of, of branches. Um, now, in September 1869 at the Baal Conference, this was what marked the, uh, the final definitive defeat of, bourgeois, of, of the bourgeois liberals within the international. Elements like Kungre, the Swiss bourgeois, and the Proudhonists. So by 1869, the work which began in the early days had given fruition in, in, the, in the existence of an international organization with branches across Europe and a few, a few outside, um, uh, based on the ideas of Marxism. But here you have the, the fun starts, because it's, it's now that you have the appearance of the Bakuninists, the, the Bakunin, the founders of the anarchists, which the anarchists to this day pride themselves as being the anti-authoritarian, etc., etc., which, which has got nothing to do with the reality of history. Um, you have intrigues on the part of the Bakuninists, who create the alliance of social democracy. Um, first, they tried to get accepted on equal terms to the General Council. Imagine, you turn up to the First <coughs> International, which has branches which elect a leading body who is recognized at the General Council. You come along with your little association, and you don't say, can we join and be part of the organization? You say, no, we want to join, but we want to have um, we want to be on equal terms with the General Council, which means we're not accepting the authority of the General Council. There's going to be two uh, central authorities. Then what do they do? They, in inverted commas, disbanded officially. But of course, but they didn't. Uh, what they did was they disbanded officially and then kept their organization as a secret faction. Um, they, th th this is the description by Steckhoff on the First International. Within this alliance, the alliance of Bakunin, was formed a secret international brotherhood. The founders of the alliance belonged to it, but they endowed Bakunin with dictatorial powers. Thus the alliance became a hierarchical organization at the head of which were the international brothers. If you, the Marx and Engels actually wrote a text on the whole thing, and the theory that Bakunin had was that uh, in a country like France or Britain, it would be sufficient to have a hundred members who uh, secretly plotting, who responded to Citizen B, and who is Citizen B? It's about Bakunin. Um, now this, this is this is so-called anti-authoritarianism um, of, of, of the anarchists. Now, um, Bakunin uh, idealized not the working class, uh, he idealized the lumpen and dispossessed youth of the upper classes, layers falling out of the, of the, of the, of the wealthier classes, and not um, not the proletariat, um, and if you um, if if you see um, the intrigues and the going, there's lots of texts that you can read um, on Marxist.com written by Alan, quite in detail of the things that they got up to, um, and they have nothing whatsoever to do with anti-authoritarianism. They were a form of reformism in the sense that they actually rejected the political um, struggle of the. Um, of the working class. Um, now, this development of the uh, anarchist faction within uh, the international comes at a time when there is something important is about to break out in Europe. The Franco-Prussian War, um, in which Germany, uh, or Prussia, very quickly defeated uh, the French forces. Now, in the, in the face of such a situation, um, on the 4th of September 1870, there was a political revolution in France which proclaimed a republic. And there were several uprisings across France <coughs> which were crushed in the provinces. But um, in March of 1871, the 18th of March 1871, there's a decisive rising in Paris. And that is when the Paris Commune is proclaimed. The Paris Commune is really the first example in history of an attempt of the working class to seize power and to create a new society. It was the first embryonic form of a worker state where the power was in the hands of the, the workers that had risen. There were similar risings in Lyon, Bordeaux, Marseille. These were all successfully suppressed, but not the Paris Commune, where obviously you had the most advanced um, uh, workers. Um, the internationalists, i.e., 
the members of the first international in the Paris Commune. Um, on the Commune of 92 members, there were 17 internationalists, so they were a minority within the Commune. But even of these 17, um, many were influenced by the relics of Proudhonism and those ideas, so the genuine, let's say, Marxists were very, very uh, weak. Um, now, it, this, this first attempt at creating a world state, one, it was isolated. Uh, there was no coordination, no party across France coordinating the, the, the work. <coughs> no working class party to lead um, the movement. And they also made several mistakes. They, they could have attacked Versailles, the headquarters of reaction, and destroyed them. They could have nationalized the National Bank. They didn't. They left the financial uh, levers in the hands of the bourgeois. These are all criticisms which Marx made of the Paris Commune, while at the same time fully supporting the Paris Commune and doing everything to, 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 to help it. There was a, you can see in the, in the leaders of the Paris Commune a certain naivety, a lack of a scientific understanding of bourgeois society. Now, even Marx drew some lessons from the Paris Commune. Um, if you read the pre 1872 preface to the Communist Manifesto, you know, very often you skip prefaces, but the, the prefaces to the Communist Manifesto are um, as good as, as the text itself. He drew a conclusion about the state. And here you see how Marxism isn't, it wasn't a ready-made dogma imposed from above. It was, it's the theory, theory um, how do you call it, the, the generalization of the experience of the working class in the form of theory. And um, what Marx said in the, uh, wrote in the 1872 preface was, you cannot take the ready-made state machine, the bourgeois state, but you must smash it. This is something which becomes clear after the Paris Commune. After he analyzed the experience and drew conclusions from it. Engels also used it to, to, write, to, to look at the question of how to combat bureaucratization, such as the right of recall, such as the wages of, of, of the officials that are elected. Nonetheless, the Paris Commune was a terrible defeat, and it marked a major turning point across the whole of Europe. It determined the mood within the working class and the labor movement across Europe. With that defeat, it was a political defeat, a brutal defeat, thousands of militants were massacred, many more escaped into exile. Um, but this defeat prepared the ground for a new period of expansion of capitalism. It's a bit like the defeat after the Second World War, the defeat of the Italian, the Greek, the French revolutions, prepared the ground for the post-war period and the boom. And to prepare with it, because of the boom, a new period of class collaboration within, in, in, the, in, in, in society. In Britain, in Britain, um, in 1871, it's not by chance that it was 1871, the 1871 Act was legalised the trade unions. So you see that there's a knock-on effect for the British workers of the Paris Commune. The British bourgeoisie, in attempting to defuse the you cannot, you cannot hold on to power simply by repressing. You also have to make concessions and give something um, to diffuse the, 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 the movement. Um, and it was a side effect of the Paris Commune allowing the trade unions to function legally. <coughs> and with this came a period of opportunism with arbitration, mediation, and negotiation around the table. Um, and this... Um, um, in this period, that's the late 60s and throughout the 70s in Britain, we see the adaptation of the labor leaders to the bourgeois society. Once revolution seems to be off the agenda and is defeated in France, and then you have the expansion of capitalism and the legalization of the trade unions where the boss is, so now, look, this is progress. The idea that you can gradually reform, look, the bourgeois are prepared to give us the right to organize the trade unions, and they're even giving us some concessions, but well, revolution is not the answer, it's nego negotiation and um, collaboration with the bosses. Um, and this continued uh, for a long period of time and is at the root of what happened later in the Labour Movement internationally. Um, it, Bakunin began his manoeuvres and he tried, uh, first he tried to take over the League for Peace and Freedom, the previous organisation I talked about. Having failed to do that, he split away with a small minority and in 1868, entered the Swiss 
uh, section of the, uh, the romance section of the International Workers Association, Working Men's Association. Initially, he backed Marx on some issues, pretending to be in agreement. Um, but he was fundamentally against the political movement of the working class. This was a, a, one of the fundamental ideas of, of the black humanists. He took some of his ideas from Proudhon, in fact. Um, but let's look at his base. He was strong, not in Britain, not in Germany, i.e. not where the working class was strong and developed and had organizations and had a tradition of moving as a class, but he was stronger in countries like Italy and Spain, not by chance. At that stage, Italy and Spain were still quite un under underdeveloped countries with a large peasantry, a large petty bourgeois, um, and the anarchist ideas, individualist ideas, had, had a grip there. So, so much for the, um, as I said, um, uh, the, the, as I was saying before, the, the anti-authoritarianism. If we look at what, um, uh, what he said here about uh, Bakunin, um, it was Bakunin, not Marx, who associated the likes of Nechayev, who was a, uh, an insurrectionary sort of uh, plotter. Um, it says he, he wrote with him pamphlets on a new social order to be created. And this, this is his description of the new social order. By concentrating all the means of social existence in the hands of our committee and the proclamation of compulsory physical labor for everyone. Um, in this, in this anti-authoritarian anti paradise, there would be compulsory residence in communal dormitories, rules for hours of work, feeding of children, etc. And this is what Marx commented on. He said, these are the words of Marx. What a beautiful model of barrack room communism. Here you have it all. Communal eating, communal sleeping, assessors and offices regulating education, production, consumption, in a world, all social activity. And to crown it all, our committee, that's this small group of, of, of organized men, anonymous and unknown to anyone, as the supreme dictator. This indeed is the purest, purest anti-authoritarianism. These are the words of Marx. Um, now, this conflict uh, with the anarchists, which, 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 which raged after the defeat, particularly after the defeat of the Paris Commune, um, was a consequence, was in part a consequence of the defeat and the mood which was being generated within um, the working class. The General Council started to find itself in a difficult situation with the growth of, on the one hand, ultra-left anarchist ideas, and on the other hand, the strengthening of the reformist elements within the movement. For example, John Hales, an English trade unionist, um, was the general secretary of the International Working Men's Association. But he was a reformist with nationalist prejudices, but he was the general secretary. Um, now, th these are the kind of people Marx had to work with throughout the building of the First International, and he explained his method, which is something which I think a lot of the sectarians, a lot of people on the left in general, um, either never known, never read about, or if they did, they didn't understand it, and if they did ever know it, they'd forgotten it. Marx explained that his method in dealing with bourgeois liberals, trade unionists, reformists, Proudhonists, all of them, he said his, his method was mild in manner, but bold in content, which I think should be the motto of our tendency, i.e., we win arguments not by shouting at people, not by insulting them, not by being arrogant, etc. On the contrary, the form should be as friendly and, uh, as possible. As possible. Not always possible. But at least we should, we should strive. But more importantly, the content, i.e., I remember, I remember Ted Grant used to insist on this, facts and figures. This, this is what strengthens our argument. We come with the facts, with the figures, with the analysis, with the historical experience, with the knowledge of how society works, and we explain it in a, in a, in a, in a friendly and firm manner, and bring out the arguments and the general conclusions from the facts. Now, um, it was in this context that Bakunin, Bakunin began to call for the autonomy, autonomy of the national sections. Have you heard that one before somewhere? <coughs> um, 
And he got some sympathy from the reformist elements. Why? Well, if you're a reformist in a section, and there's the general council, which has now established itself as a, as a socialist leadership uh, um, in the international, giving guidance and analysis and uh, etc. You, you politically, you're in resistance to that. Well, of course, national autonomy appeals to you because we have the right to decide our own affairs, not this international body which tells us um, what to do. And he represented the coming to the fore in the more backward sections. Um, London was then invaded by a, a mass of uh, exiles from France, exiles from the Paris Commune, which was an extremely demoralized uh, milieu, people who had drawn all kinds of conclusions from the defeat. Um, and there was also the concrete need to help them financially, um, etc. Uh, we've seen this before uh, amongst ex the exile community, which is isolated from, from the, the, the class and the, the label in which it was working in, and with defeat and with the growth of all kinds of alien ideas, you can see the demoralization which was setting in. Um, at one point, there was the demand that there should be no central leadership of the international. Yeah, does anybody remember anybody in, uh, in, in the more recent periods? Um, no central leadership, no centralized party. Um, basically, everybody can do whatever they want. Well, of course, that's not democracy. Democracy within a party whether they're wrong or right, is the majority decides. The majority elects a leadership and a program and policy, and if you don't have that, you don't have a party. That is the essence of a party. A party is a, a collectively disciplined organization which debates democratically, then votes, takes a position, and you know, that is the position of the organization. They were against it. Um, they started accusing Marx of authoritarianism. <coughs> the Bakuninists started to, accusing Marx and authoritarianism, um, when all, all the general council was doing was actually acting on the decisions of the international congresses. They were elected and they acted on the democratically taken decisions. Um, now, the, 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 in 1872, the conflict climaxed at the Hague Congress and there was the final split. Bakunin was expelled for his secret faction because he was working against the rules of the organization. Um, and Marx and Engels, um, in, in order to try and uh, remove the General Council from the horrible uh, asphyxiating atmosphere that existed in Europe and in London in particular in these conditions, he proposed relocating the General Council to New York where he felt it would be far away from, the, from these uh, influences and there'd be a new fresh labor movement in, in America. Um, they did that but then eventually in 1876 in the Philadelphia uh, Congress the first international was um, disbanded. Now, why did Marx and Engels propose the disbanding of the international? Well, you see, think of it this way. In those conditions, had the first international continued formally as an, as an organization, it would have underwent the pressures of reformism, ultra-leftism, opportunism, all kinds of tendencies, and the banner of the first international would have been destroyed. As it was, the heritage of the First International was maintained, and it didn't die. Different national groups continued to exist in correspondence with Marx and Engels. There was still an international movement, but no organization as such, um, and with a clean banner of the First International. Now, I, I've got to end here, but the, you see how the First International was a means by which Marx and Engels, through their patient work, argument inside the organ this organization, spread the ideas of Marxism throughout um, the different countries it was in, and established the nuclei that would later on, and this is a separate discussion, would later on go to form what would become the Second International, which comes into existence not as an association of different currents, but comes into existence declaring itself from day one a Marxist organization, although there's more to it than that because the, 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 the influences were there as well. That's a separate discussion. But this was the works of Marx, the work of Marx and Engels. And you see, the nature of the international, as I said before, was not you know, a, a homogenous 100% everybody's a Marxist. It was a, a, a much looser type of organization with different trends and currents, different types of organizations affiliated to it. And within it, Marx and Engels patiently worked to push their ideas. 
1886, long after this, there's an interesting letter from Engels to a German social democrat in America. And this was like 40 years after the early days of the movement of the 40s. And he was critical of the German social democrats. Many of them have, you know, emigrated to America. And they tried to continue uh, propagating the ideas of socialism in, in America. Engels criticized them. First and foremost, he said, you've got to learn English. Your papers are in German. How can the American workers understand what you have to say? Um, but he said, you cannot force down the throat of American workers a ready-made, all-encompassing dogma. He said, learn from our experience, 40 years' experience. You've got to um, go through the experience of the American workers, step by step, and in each experience, use it to raise the level one step further, and eventually, you know, win over the workers to uh, Marxism. And he criticized them for not going into the mass movements as they were. They wanted to kind of impose a preconceived view, a social democratic party, i.e. a Marxist party in America, when there were mass movements in America, particularly the Knights of Labor, which was a mass phenomenon, the first real expression of the organized American workers politically, who, many of whom were liberals and bourgeois in their thinking, but Engels saw it as, as a genuine bona fide mass movement, and he said what the German Social Democrats should do is go in to that movement and bring the ideas of Marxism into that movement and work it up. If you think about it, is this not the method of the international Marxist tendency? Um, we are a tendency, a left opposition within the labor movement, and we work within the existing mass organizations of the working class, patiently arguing our ideas with facts and figures on the basis of experience and raising the level and strengthening the Marxist current. Um, we, our method really, is the continuation of the method of Marx and Engels as we saw it in the period of the First International. It's not, you know, the ready-made Marxist organization that declares itself a party of two or three and, exp and expects the masses to bow down before the Marxists who have this great authority because they're right. You can be right, but you've actually got to convince people that you're right. And that can take an awful long time in the, in the labor movement. But I hope that by with what I've outlined, to have given a taste of what the, um, um, the First International was like. There is a text which I've based a lot of my uh, talk on, which is called History of the First International by a guy called G. M. Steckloff. And you can find it on the Marxist Internet Archive. And it's actually quite a thorough uh, account, chapter by chapter, year by year, Congress by Congress, of um, the first international and, um, and how it, um, it developed. But I will leave it there. More in general, on the question of the working class, you see, at the root, at the root of reformism is this idea that they are the realists. And we, the revolutionaries, are the utopians. We don't understand the working class. And very often you get this, even, even within Marxists, oh, I'm a worker. And therefore, I understand more than you do, because you are not a worker. And that is nonsense, because that would make every worker a brilliant scientific socialist and, and someone who can analyze the whole of society and history simply because he's a worker. Uh, being a worker does make it easier to understand the conditions of workers, that is true. And uh, we base ourselves on the working class and we have to build a movement that's based on the working class. But if we base ourselves on the thinking of workers in a particular moment, then we'll be lost. Because you see, the working class, the, the, the people who raise this idea that, you know, the working class, we are workers, right? Workers change. So what working class are you referring to? Are you referring to, to the working class after a major historical defeat, followed by a boom, in which their conditions, material conditions improve, and the idea then develops that things are going to get better and better and better within capitalism, and therefore, you know, the idea of socialism is redundant. 
Um, if you base yourself on that, then you become a reformist. Now, the, the, um, the, the, it's a separate discussion. The second international, the reformism, which came to dominate within the second international, was based on the long period of boom and the idea that, you know, the struggle for socialism is delayed to some long distant future, whereas now there's the struggle for wages and conditions, and that is everything. As you can see, Marx did not pull back from being involved in strikes and solidarity and the rest of it. Um, but even on the co-ops, he didn't completely oppose the co-op, but he explained the limitations of it. Um, now, we understand that the working class, we look at the working class not as it is, but as it will become. Um, the crisis will change the thinking of the class. The same workers who can be so-called realists, not interested in politics and for a long period, um, just interested in getting on with their lives, as long as the system allows that to be, then most workers will not turn to politics. Um, now, Marxists base themselves not just on the immediate interests of the working class, but on the general historical interests of the working class um, within the context of capitalism. Capitalism means crisis, we understand that. But that also means it has an effect on the working class and changes the working class thereby. The working class can become very revolutionary, far more revolutionary than the most left-wing of the leaders of the labor movement. The same workers who previously would have supported the most moderate and not of, 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 of leaders because it seemed to correspond to their needs. But when these are exposed, and for instance, look at Greece. Look at what happened to the PASOK. I mean, there's an example of the party that's been in power for decades being reduced to a very small force. And there was a time when, if you'd been in Greece, most workers would have been PASOK supporters. Not anymore. Why? Well, something's changed, clearly. The crisis has put to the test the leaders of the PASOK, and they've been found to be um, um, lacking in something. Now, because the working class changes on the basis of the crisis, the organizations of the working class will also change on the basis of the crisis. Not immediately and not automatically. And because there's a bureaucracy at the top, they will resist um, the change. But the trade unions, for instance, which in normal times can be the most stifling place to work, full of bureaucrats and reformists and um, <coughs> realists, realists, you know, we're dealing with the real problems of the work. You're talking about socialist revolution. Um, well, at the moment, these leaders of the unions and the workers' parties are finding themselves precisely in what Conrad said there. Well, we're really quite nice people, and we don't like to cut. We don't, well, uh, the difference between like, these people and the Tories is the Tories enjoy cutting, and then like, they don't. Um, but they all do it. And at the end of the day, whether it's been done nicely or horribly, the hospital closed. And I don't have uh, an accident with an emergency department to rush to if I have a problem. And as a consequence, maybe one of my relatives will die because the ambulance takes too long to get to the hospital. Now, whether you did that nicely with a smile or with a vicious Tory look, it doesn't make a fundamental difference to work. <coughs> um, and in fact, they're angrier sometimes with the people who do it with a smile because they're the ones who are supposed not to do it. They're the ones who are supposed to be defending the workers. And so the workers can sometimes be very angry against their own leaders because they expect it from the Tories, they don't expect it from their own um, uh, uh, leaders. Now, um, that means that the pressure builds up within the trade unions to take action. And at a certain point, the trade union leaders are forced to call strikes against their, their own nature. And in the process, workers begin to mobilize and struggle and start to draw conclusions. And that means the trade unions undergo a process of change um, through different <coughs> stages, um, through struggle, through experience, and through coming into conflict with some of the trade union leaders, which then leads to a process of an attempt to change the leaders. And uh, gradually, by speaking, step by step, you end up with a trade union, which looks very different to what it did before, under the pressure of the working class itself. From that, the workers draw political conclusions as well. And even a party like the Labour Party, which at this moment is dominated by people who have no alternative to capitalism whatsoever, but because what is the Labour Party based on? Even if it's not got a very strong, big active base, 
It has to count on the votes of workers to govern, to get, for, for even, for, even from a purely sort of careerist point of view, to be elected, you've got to win the workers' votes. Um, you know, I live in an area where whoever stands, Labour wins. Because it's a very working class area. Traditionally, they've always done that. But the, but the mood of working people is changing. And that means it will change. It will take time for that to happen, but it will happen. Now, the basis of reformism, as I said, is pragmatism in times of economic boom and expansion, when capitalism seems to be working. And therefore, they're the ones who appear to be realistic. And in those periods, it can be very difficult to be a Marxist or to defend a Marxist position. And that can also have an effect on Marxists, who can start to draw the wrong conclusions from such a situation, especially if it lasts for a long, long time. Either they can gradually become reformists, and there's many ex-Marxists around who are leading trade unions in here, um, uh, who are ex-militants, or it can lead to ultra-left ideas, i.e., you know, there's no point in working in the mass organizations and the working class doesn't understand. We're, we're basically, a kind of, the stuff we saw in the first international. Um, the reality is that the working class um, and, the, and the objective reality is dialectical. It changes according to certain um, laws. And more importantly than anything else, we understand that experience teaches. And that's why correct ideas, as I said at the beginning, can start to get an echo within the, the mass of working people as the conditions change and confirm the correctness of a particular idea or not. That's why reformism is in crisis, although it still, it still has immense authority and, 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 and influence within the movement, but it also explains why there's a growing interest in Marxist ideas. And have you noticed that these TV programs, including yesterday's, there's a, a constant referring to, well, Marx was right on one thing, I mean, he seems to have got it right. I mean, is, 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 is this crisis not confirming that Marx might have been right? dread the idea and they tremble as they say it, you know, and hope that the guy in certain front will give them the answer that no, 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 it wasn't right. But it keeps popping up and popping up. What it means is, inevitably, there's, there's, there's growing interest in what Marx said, because whatever they want to say, he was right. Um, and there are periods in which it can seem he was wrong, but the, but the history keeps reconfirming uh, the nature of capitalism. Um, and we understand how through experience, the working class draws conclusions. Life teaches, they draw the conclusions because we understand <clears throat> the basic contradictions of capitalism will inevitably feed through into a major crisis which will impact on the living conditions of workers. And workers learn from that. And if, that this is the, the other element of which I'll finish on, what Marx was trying to do in the first international was to build a party that would lead the working class in changing society. A party, a party based on a particular analysis, a perspective, and a program, and was trying to win over, first of all, the most advanced layers of the movement as a means of later reaching the wider layers of the working class. And that's how we should see our task. It's the same task, except that we have a lot more history to base ourselves on. And in the end, our analysis of history is not because like history, although we like history as well. I like reading history books and understanding all kinds of stuff about the past of, of humanity and the world. But the reason we study history is because it's the laboratory of the class struggle. It's where we see what happens when certain things uh, come into being. Um, what happens when there's a crisis happens? What kind of struggles do workers um, uh, organize? What kind of parties? what effects certain ideas have and the defeats of the working class and why they, they took place. All of this is history which we use to understand the present and to try and work out the most likely perspective of what is going to be coming in the future and we prepare for it. And if there's one fundamental lesson of history is that if, you know, is, that, is this, capitalism inevitably enters into crisis, whatever the Adam Institute the Adam Smith Institute says, not the Adam, sorry, the Adam Smith Institute says, um, whatever they try and say, capitalism enters into crisis and severe crisis and leads to class struggle. I don't think anybody can deny that if you look at Europe, you look at the Arab world and beyond. 
And what history also teaches is that the most favorable condition, the deepest crisis of capitalism, the most marvelous movement of the working class, doesn't guarantee the victory of the working class. That's a key lesson we have to learn. An organization has to be built before the events happen that organizes the advanced elements and educates them in a, in a Marxist understanding of society and history and prepares a party which can connect with the mass when the masses draw the revolutionary conclusions that the Marxists have used beforehand. When the two things are combined, then it becomes an unstoppable force that can change society. Otherwise, it's defeat. Um, and that's why we discuss things like the experience of the First International and the method of Marx. And we try and learn from it and apply the lessons of it and also the methods of it. And I think we have to imbue our comrades with this understanding because if we build a solid Marxist tendency based on this tradition, <coughs> we will build a powerful tendency within the labor movement because the ideas are correct, they're true. It's not that we, it, 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 this is the way society is built, this is the way it functions, this is the way capitalism functions, and it leads to certain conclusions. And that's how we have to, we have to act upon that conviction.